and welcome to the Read Local Show presented by Lit Carnival and me, your host, Toy Thomas, author, blogger, and reading advocate. I'm so excited to share today's guest with you. James L. Hill, raised on blues, soul, and rock and roll, gave him the heart of a flower child. Educated by the turmoil of Vietnam, the civil rights movement, and the sexual revolution produced a gladiator. Let's meet James L. Hill. All right, James, I'm so excited to have you here with us today. Um, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself? Okay, I am James L. Hill. I also go by J. L. Hill, uh, writer, author of adult crime novels, which is where the J. L. Hill comes in at, and fantasy and sci-fi, which you can find underneath my full name, James L. Hill. So if you have any problem, just look up James Hill, you'll find me. <laughs> nice. All right. So I um, always kind of give this little introduction that I started this whole process because I am an avid reader. I love books and I want to advocate for people to read more. And I feel like people will read more if we just talk about books more. And so that's where the first segment of my interview comes in. It's called On the Bookshelf. And I'm going to ask you a little bit about you as a reader. You ready? Ready. All right. So the first question that I came up with, um, do you or have you ever done like a reading challenge? Like I'm doing a reading challenge right now for me to read something nonfiction every month. Do you do reading challenges? Uh, I did a Goodreads reading challenge one time and I put up there that I was going to read like 12 books which was like one book a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I failed this movie at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a publisher, so I do get to read quite a bit, mm -hmm. but I don't read sometimes as much as I should, or I don't get to read like already finished product by other people. So yeah. it's like, you know, because I'm publishing and I'm reading so much stuff to put out, you know, for other people, for my publishing company. Yeah. So I'm, I'm challenged anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I do the Goodreads challenge every year. And I was just thinking that sometimes I get upset when I'm like, not, I don't get upset, but like it irks me if I'm like beta reading for someone. I'm like, man, I can't count this book towards my challenge because it's not published yet. Yep. Yep. You can't. There's only published books. And that's why I put like 12. I said, oh, I could put up 12. But then I found out, yeah, the stuff that's not published don't count. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so my next question is, do you ever reread books? Yes, yes, I do. I have gone back and read Siddhartha a couple of times. Uh, I read uh, Fahrenheit 451 over. Uh, I read a couple of Stephen uh, King's novels and I went back and reread re -read those. Uh, Asmanoff, sometimes I read them a couple of times. Okay. So, so yeah, if I really like the book, I, I might go back and read it. I'm not one who goes back and read a whole lot of stuff that I already read, but it's like, I'll find the book, I'll, you know, find it in my pile somewhere. And it's like, oh yeah, I like this book. Let me, you know what? And then what happens is I don't mean to reread the book, but <laughs> I start reading because, you know, I'm looking for a specific uh, uh, quote yeah. or something. Yeah. And then before I know it, I'm halfway through the book and figured I might well finish it. Yeah, <laughs> I do that with my own books, too. Like I'm looking, you know, I want to put a quote up in Facebook. I want to put a quote out there, you know, and I start reading my own book. And then I realize, why are you reading your own book? <laughs> <laughs> skip to the, it's not in that chapter, skip to the next chapter. <laughs> yeah, I've done that before, too. I let, Like you said, it's not like I do it all the time, but I do catch myself. I'll be looking for something. And like you said, next thing you know, well, I just finished reading that book for the third time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it draws you in. What's funny to me is my own writing draws me in. And I heard this said about musicians that they don't listen to their own music. And they think it's quite weird if, if you know, you go to somebody's house and they're listening to their own stuff. <laughs> You know, I think I used to feel that way. And I, I, I think the first time I sat down to read something that I wrote, it was so weird, but I got a lot out of it. Like, I felt like I could see where I was growing, you know, and things like that. So even though it looks weird from the outside to see someone reading their own stuff, like I totally get it. Yeah. 
Now, I, I do it at the very beginning when I first write it and everything. Of course, you got to go through the editing right. and, the re, and the revision. And after you get the finished product out, you read it, you put it down, you walk away, you come back, you read it again to see if you still got the same feeling for the, for the book. But, you know, three or four years later, you find yourself sitting there reading your book again. <laughs> it's like, you know, I could be doing other stuff. I don't have to read this book. I, I know it backwards and forwards now. So... It's like, yeah, it, it just happens sometimes, you know, you get you get caught up in it. And and it's funny because I can still get caught up in my own work even. Yeah, I, I think sometimes and I know maybe maybe this is the experience that you have is that you forget like maybe how clever you were with something or man, I was really like digging deep when I wrote that or something. Yep. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I amaze myself sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So the last question that I want to ask is, um, do you listen to audiobooks? Once in a while, because to listen to audio, I, with my ex-wife, when we would be driving places, she likes audiobooks. In fact, she even listens to them now when she's not driving. So she, so uh, we went to the grandkids baseball game yesterday and she was sitting there listening to an audio book while the game was going. So she liked audio books. So when we'd be driving, if she's driving, she had the audio book playing and we're yeah. listening to it and stuff like that. When I'm driving, I can't do that because it takes me away from what I'm doing, which is driving. Yeah. So I get, <laughs> I get totally caught up in the book and then I'm not paying attention to the road. But I do do it when I'm on like planes, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm flying places, things like that. Yeah. You know, sitting in the airport or something. Then, yeah, I can I can put on the audio book and, you know, listen to listen to it and stuff. You know, it's, it's fun. It depends on a book, though. I really like a book that had character actors in it. Yeah. It it story, not somebody who just reading dry, blah, 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 blah. This is, you know, just reading me the story. I don't like that. I like it when you get a little bit of the character, even if it's yeah. just one person doing it. You know, a real good audio book will have somebody who can voice the, the characters and stuff like that. Well, see, and like I, um, when I started, you know, reading the audiobooks, I pretty much had it like spe specific to, it had to be a book with, that was very like character driven, lots of different, you know, um, complex characters, like really in depth, like world building, like something that I could just kind of like tune out the rest of the world and focus in on, on the world that was in the audiobook. And so um, I found a narrator that I really liked and he did a couple of books like that. And then I found something that he did that was not character driven. And he still delivered like the same like emotional like performance, but I was just like, it's not the same. This is really more of a plot driven story. There's not this huge, amazing world going on. So I do think for certain people like, like me, like it has to be a specific kind of story for me to really get into the audiobook. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. All right. So that's enough about you as a reader. I want to talk a little bit about you as the writer. I know you're also a publisher. So some of this might overlap with that. Um, I want to know as either a writer or a publisher, a creative person, do you keep some type of creative journal? Not anymore. Okay. I used to when I was uh, younger and first started writing. I would sit there and I would write dreams out and I taught myself the lucid dream okay. so that I could, you know, work out stories in my dreams and, you know, come up with things, especially when I got the spark where I was, you know, getting hung up and stuff, especially writing sci-fi, you know, writing sci-fi lucid dreaming is really good for that because you're making up stuff and basing it off of reality. Yeah. But it's, it's, and then I would wake up and I write down a few, say, oh yeah, it, this could happen and that could happen. And as I got older, I found writing things down never really worked out as well because either I forget what I would write them down. I had notebooks full of stuff, but I would never go back to the notebooks. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you just have notebooks full of stuff. And I had like, you know, the three by five notebooks and I have the regular size notebook and all, and you write stuff in there and you don't go back to it for like years. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I have a stack of notebooks sometimes and I go in there and if I pull them out, I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh that, <laughs> yeah, I remember that story I was gonna write. Yeah, never wrote it. 
it made an entry in the notebook, but you know, never went any further. You know, you have so many ideas sometimes that is just writing down the ideas is good sometimes, but if you don't act on them, <laughs> you know. It's funny that you say that because I think I'm the same way. Like I used to, like you, I used to have a journal, had all these ideas written down and misplaced it one day and realized it was like a year later and I found it and I was like, oh, I guess I wasn't really using that journal that much. <laughs> I, I found that if I do have an idea, I go ahead and start like a document on my computer and start working on the idea yes. as opposed to just collecting ideas. Yeah, And that's what I do now. So that computers and everything is like, you know, first off, I'm a computer programmer by day. I'm a right. software engineer. Okay. So I spend a lot of time on the, on the computer. And if an idea comes to me, I open up a file and I stick it in there and I write it up and I try to get it much down at that time. And then, of course, I don't do anything with it. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, these ideas come and not every one of them is a gem right? <laughs> and not every one of them you're going to follow. As a matter of fact, I have a notebook up there. My thing that I bought It's a journal, leather bound journal that I bought at uh, one of the conventions or one of the bookshelves or something that I was at. Mm -hmm. And I only bought it because I liked the way it was handmade and I liked the way it looked. <laughs> so I have written nothing in that journal, <laughs> but it looked really cool. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, you know, sometimes as a writer, you have to have things that look cool on your bookshelf. Like to me, yeah. that's part of the inspiration. Like, oh, that looks good up there. <laughs> yeah. And I keep saying that one day I'm going to fill that journal with a great story. <laughs> that's going to be a great story. I'm going to write a great story in that journal. But right now, it's still sitting up there in the corner of my thing, and I have written nothing in it. But, but it, it looks, looks really nice. It's leather it bound, good. got a tie to it. it looks <laughs> great. <laughs> nice. All right. So my next question is, um, and you can decide, because I know, like I said, you're a writer and you're also a publisher. So, um, and I know you've mentioned to me before, because we, we, we've talked in person before, um, that you have an editor that you work with, but from your standpoint as a writer, how do you approach the editing process? Um, as a writer and a terrible speller and a, and a horrible person of grammar, I failed English. Let me just put that out there right, right at the beginning. <laughs> I have failed English. English is my second language. I have no first language. <laughs> <laughs> so I have been told that, you know, I have seen people who who have English as a second language that write better than you do, <laughs> that know English better than you do. So as an editor, I will have to go back and really carefully reread what I've written. Mm -hmm. And I go back and because I type badly, okay, I have become much better at typing because I write code and stuff, but I type badly. I do horrible things with tenses and, <laughs> and everything that you could probably do wrong in literature and in writing, I probably do. And then I go back and as I write, and this is my process, let me give you my process of writing. Okay. okay? I don't write anything until I have the full story in mind. Okay. So I'll write a synopsis. I'll write chapters. I'll, I'll break the, the synopsis down into chapters. So I'll write a chapter uh, outline. I'll put in the chapter outline what I want to go into the story. And then I use that as my mainframe to start building the story out. And I write only the bare bones of the story. I only write like the action characters, bring them in. And I build out a bare framework of the story. And then once I got that, and I got all the way through to the end. And this is part of something I learned to do while I would do a nano write mode. And so when I, get, when I get through to that part of the story and I get the whole flow of the story out, mm -hmm. I then put it away for a couple of weeks, a few days, and then I come back to it and I start reread it and rewrite it and put in other things, filling it out. And then I go back again on the third or fourth or fifth revision and start editing what I write, try to make the tenses match, try to make the... the you know, try to do all the English stuff that I really am bad at <laughs> yeah. and try to get that done before I send it off to my editor who will then 
rake me over the coals for some things <laughs> that I still do wrong. <laughs> but you know, it's but it's a it's a process. Yeah. And writing is a process. And everybody, I don't, I know you heard this before, but but writing is a process. It's never simply just sit down and write a book. Yeah, it's I know a lot of people have that write. misconception that you just sit down and write a book. But like you said, it's totally a process. Yeah. And that's the thing that I really nailed down. I really, over the years, I finally nailed down the process of writing. And so it takes a while. And now the way I used to do it before I got into nano write mode, and I still go back and do that sometimes, is I'll write three or four chapters, go back, read those three or four chapters, edit them a little, edit them as I go, and then write the next three or four chapters. Then I go back, reread those chapters, and edit them as I go through all the way to the point where now I'm writing the next set, section. Takes a year or two to write a book that way. Let me tell you. I'm sure. And see, that's one of the reasons why I love doing this because I love hearing about everybody's like different processes. Like I know I couldn't write, a pro like you know, going like to read something that I wrote, edit it, rewrite it, and the move, and then like it would. I yeah. But that's <laughs> what's so great about it. Like once you come up with whatever process works for you, then that's the process that works for you. And I yeah. think that's so cool. Yeah. And, and that's the way I wrote for years until I did NaNoWrite mode, which is the National Novel Writing for your audience who may not know. The National yeah. Novel Writing Month, month yeah. in November. Yep. And so when I started, you can't go back and edit when you do that because you got to get 50,000 words out in a month. Yep. And that is a lot of writing. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so you don't have a chance to go back and edit. So I have built my synopsis. I built my chapter uh you know outline i have my my bullet points of, at the beginning of each chapter you know three or four things you want to cover in the chapter and then for nano write mode i just write straight through that's boom 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 mm -hmm. and i just follow my bullet points at the beginning of the chapter and i just you know flow that outline that that first draft out and so much faster but then of course you got to go back and put meat on the bones so exactly yeah. yeah then you spend the next couple of months doing that yeah uh, but much quicker to do it that way than to go back and forth back and forth but the thing i like about going back and forth you don't wind up with plot holes okay it's true yeah because, because you're constantly updating what what happened so you're not missing something you got oh man i gotta go back and fix that right because you fix it, you go forward, and then as the new ideas come in, you have a fresh idea what you wrote, and plus rereading what you wrote gives you other ideas going forward. Now, you could, you know, drive yourself off into a wild tangent coming <laughs> ahead <laughs> because you lost the track of the, your main story. But if you have the good outlines going, then you don't really lose track. You start thinking, like, oh, wait a second, wait a second. No, 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 that's taking me way out to left field. We can't follow that track. <laughs> You know, that's going to take me way, way a feel of what this story's about. You know, note to myself, book two. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I yeah. like that. I like that. So I want to now get into what I call a book signing, where we actually get to talk about some of your publications. Now, just from what I know about you, you have, um, I know you have the five books. I'll, I'll, I'll get you off the hook. I have five books printed already published yeah but you have you have a killer series is that it's, it's called the killer right. series killer series and then you have two other books right okay so we're, i'm gonna ask you some questions about each like one one is gonna be about your series and, and the other questions are gonna be about the other two books okay okay so what i know about the killer series and you can of course jump in and clarify anything is you've written the story Kind of, it's kind of like a, a mobster story, right? Yes, it is a mob gang story set in like the 70s, 80s, and 90s in okay. New York, which is okay. where I'm from originally. Okay. And so what I want to know, is there any part of the killer series that is autobiographical? Yeah. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. It's based on people that I know, but it's not based on any one person that I know. Okay. So okay. yeah, I had lots of mob friends 
And one of the books is dedicated to, I think the last book or the book before that. One of them is dedicated to the guy I used to work with, okay. who we used to call the Godfather, because he was he was high up in the mob. <laughs> so, okay. so I I mean I met people who were high up in the mob, and I met what we call the junior mafia, which is you know guys who were teenagers and couldn't wait to get into the mob because their uncles and fathers and brothers were already in. So okay. you meet some people who are wannabes and some people who are definitely are. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a mixture of a bunch of people that I know. It's a mixture of the time that I grew up in. Like I said, the 70s through the 90s mm -hmm. in New York was a very interesting time to live with the gangs and things. Gangs were really starting to become uh, widespread and very large, even though in the 60s when I was living in the South Bronx, you know, I had a gang of six or seven people. And then there were gangs of 20 and 30 and 50 people. Right. So, you know, our gang was very small and caused a lot of ruckus and trouble. But, you know, we were nowhere near the size of the Fox Street gang or, you know, the Banana Kelly gang and stuff right. like that. Who had like, because you were the gang, you were in that street or in that, you know, because you lived on that street, either you had to be part of the gang or you couldn't leave your house, <laughs> basically, right. when I grew up in the South Bronx. So we used to call it Fort Apache. Okay. Yeah, because the cops named it Fort Apache because they said it was like cowboys and Indians out there every night. Wow. Which is how it got its name as Fort Apache. Wow. Yeah, it was just that wow. It was the wild, wild west out there. So writing this book, um, this series, would you say... Because you just finished the third book, right? Right. The third book is out and published. I just finished the fourth book, which is the Oh, okay. So the that's the one you were book. telling me about. You just did. So that one's not out yet. That one's not okay. out yet. No. Okay. So you just finished the fourth book. So getting, you know, you're into, the, you know, the third book of this series. Would you say that this is a feeling of accomplishment or nostalgia? Or is it a little bit of both? It's a bit of both. It, it took me a long time to write the fourth book, to finish the fourth book. Uh, I read, I won Nano Right Mode on that book in cool. 2019. <clears throat> and as you see, it's what, three years later, and I'm just getting around to publishing it. I'm just finishing it. And I decided to finish it last, last year going into this year. So it's because of the nostalgia and the idea that it's the end of the series. Um, putting these people to rest, you know, all my mm -hmm. characters and everything. So there's a bit of a nostalgia to that. Uh, and the accomplishment is I always wanted, it was always going to be a four part series. Okay. So I always had the ending from the time I wrote the first word to, to now, I always had the whole arc of the story, the whole plan of the story okay. laid out. So it is an accomplishment to finally get to the end of the series and get to the end of the story and to have told this entire uh, epic story of these people and how they become international criminals and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, so the accomplishment that I feel for having done that yeah. is like overwhelming almost. And it was daunting and terrifying to actually finish it. You know, it was like a type of thing where you want to finish, but then again, you don't want it to end. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I love the way you describe that. I I haven't been there yet, but I, I want to get there to where I have like a vision for like a series and get to the end of it. And yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and, and people ask me, well, do you think you're going to write another story about it? I said, well, that's the idea about ending the series. <laughs> you know, if I write another story about it, it's not the end of the series. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, um, I don't know. I have some other characters in there that I might write short stories around. You know, got a couple of people who are interesting people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, hitmen, killers, and, you know, other people who fall into this, into the life, as we call it, you know you're in the life okay. um so and people that are from my background who have interesting stories who i can't tell 
the exact story of because after all, that would be very bad. <laughs> yeah, I got you. <laughs> all right. So I, I am very, I'm glad I got to ask you those questions about the killer series, knowing, because I remember you telling me you finished the book, but it was not out yet. So I'm glad I got to ask you about that. I want to shift gears just a little bit. And I want to talk about The Emerald Lady because that's your fantasy book, right? Right. Okay. So I want you to give like just a brief kind of synopsis of it. And then I want you to tell me what was the best part about writing that, that book? Okay. The Emerald Lady is a historical fantasy. And I also wrote that. That was my first endeavor in the NaNoWrite mode. And I decided to write a fantasy because I've written science fiction, I've written crime stories and crime novels already. So I wanted to do NaNoWrite mode, which is a completely different way of writing. And I wanted to write a completely different uh, genre of writing. So I wouldn't fall back into my old habits of doing this and doing that. Uh, so uh, The Emerald Lady is a pirate mermaid adventure love story. Okay. So it takes place in the golden age of pirates. And Jeremy Simmons, who happened to be the main character, uh, he get caught up and in the in the hurricane and is shipwrecked. And Shira saves him. Okay. So Shira is the mermaid, okay. and she saves him. Now she goes and she asks her mother, who happened to be the queen of the mermaids, to send her sisters with her to ferry the guy back to land. So. Men fall in love with mermaids at first sight. Mermaids necess don't necessarily fall in love with men. Right. <laughs> okay. But Shira fell in love with, with Jeremy because she can sense that he was a good person. They have empath you know, empathical abilities, right? Mm -hmm. So she could feel that he was a good person and everything. And uh, she tries to save him. She causes this uh, tragedy. And then her mother curses her and Jeremy. And the curse is so bad that it causes a rift in the mermaid world and it causes this war. Wow. Now, now the war is tied up in the American Revolution and all these other things that are going on because you find out that mom is dabbling in uh, the affairs of men. Oh, okay. Because she is. Gotcha. <laughs> you know, to be in the evil queen, you know, you have to have, you know, real evil and exactly. be able to do bad things. So that that's the gist of the story of the Emerald Lady. Now, you asked me what was the exciting part that I wrote? Yeah, like what was the most fun part about writing that story? Okay, halfway through writing the story, this is where I went off into left field <laughs> <laughs> and spawned the idea that this is going to be a series. Okay. So it becomes the Gemstone series because during writing this thing, I come to the idea that we get a dragon. The last dragon is, is living on top of the mountains. So the mermaids and the dragons don't get along. And I came up with this whole uh, mythology mm -hmm. about how the, world, how, the, how the world is controlled by humans, mermaids, and dragons. Okay. And where the dragons come from. So at that point, when I decided, oh, a dragon would be a perfect being, a, per a perfect, and they're all intelligent. You know, you have right. mermaid war, intelligent men, and the dragons, of course, intelligent. You know, they're all sentient beings. And I came up with the idea, oh, what would be great to have this dragon who can see over the world, right? Because he could see through the eyes of other creatures, of flying creatures. Okay. So they go to the, so the mermaids go to the dragon. They go all the way up that mountain, far, far from water, to ask the dragon if they can find Shira and Jeremy. Okay. Okay. Now the dragons hate mermaids. <laughs> <laughs> so them going to ask the help of the dragon is very bad. And the reason why the dragons hate mermaids is because mermaids trapped all the dragons. Okay. So, <clears throat> so you got like the, the whole political drama going on in this yes. world. So yeah, so it's it's a it's a political uh, piece also. Um, I do want to ask you about one other thing. Um, you have a 
actual sci-fi story, which is really in your wheelhouse. That's where you started with sci-fi, right? Yep, that was my start. Yeah, so you have a story called Pegasus, A Journey to New England. Tell us about this book. I All mean, right. New Eden, sorry. <laughs> Journey to New Eden, yeah. yeah. Um, this I started writing way back, and I wrote this in longhand, in notebooks, while I was riding the train back and forth to work. So I wrote it in one hour intervals. Wow. And it's a dystopian sci-fi, which at the time I didn't know dystopian even existed. <laughs> but in, back in the 70s and 80s, we started shifting our view of sci-fi from being all the wonderful things that could happen. Sci-fi started taking on this, and maybe it was always like that, but started taking on this darker view of the future. Yeah. You know, like with 1984 and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, yeah. you ever go back and read 1984 again, you know, we're living that now. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and, it's terrifying. And, yeah. yeah. And so I came up with this idea because I was asked, what did I think about nuclear war? And what was the prospect? And it came about during the SALT treaties. So at the time when Reagan was negotiating the SALT treaties and things like that, the SALT treaties are, Strategic Nuclear Limitation Arm, Strategic Arm Limitation Treaty. Right. Right. So we were talking about, you know, hey, we got to we got to reduce the number of nuclear missiles we got because at that point they had the MIRVs and the MIRVs are multiple reentry vehicles, mm -hmm. and so we had one rocket that can drop twenty bombs, nuclear bombs. Right. Right. So the United States and Russia started saying, hey, you know, we we really need to draw back on some of this stuff. We got enough nuclear weapons here to destroy the world 10 times over. Yeah. You know, we don't really need that much. So uh, I was asked, what did I think about it? And what did I think about, you know, the prospects from nuclear war? And I was like, well, we're not gonna really have a nuclear war because it's a no-win situation. But the minute we find someplace else we can go, <laughs> all bets are off, you know, all cars are on the table if we don't have to come back to this planet exactly. or we can find somebody so we can live. And so that was the impetus behind uh, Pegasus. Pegasus is the first starship, that first ship that travels at light speed. Because the other problem with going anywhere in the universe is you'll never reach it, not even in your grandchildren's lifetime. Right, yeah. Right. And until you could hit light speed, and even at light speed, you're only going to go a few stars away. Right. I mean, there's like maybe a dozen or so stars that are within 25 light years of Earth. Right. Alpha Centauri, four light years. We know where that's at. Right. There's, and, we, and at that time, people didn't know if there was other planets around stars. Now we know, and we're pretty mm -hmm. sure, there's a lot of planets out there. Yeah. There's a lot of planet systems, planetary systems around other stars so we once you get to the idea that you can get someplace and it could be someplace viable that you can live now you run the risk of destroying what you have here exactly and that's what pegasus is all about okay it's the balance between because in pegasus they take everything from earth and it's the idea of like when people came to america they took everything with them that they had because they didn't know what was going to be here when they got here. Yeah. And when they got here, some of the some of the things they did was they took apart the ship and built houses out of it so that they had some place to live because they weren't going back. Right. So, you know, um, I think they said Cortez or something burned his ships so that his men would know there's no turning back. We have to conquer this land. Yeah. And and other uh, ships that came from Europe and stuff like that. When they got here, they got here with the idea of, okay, when we get there, we're going to dismantle this ship, build houses so we could survive. Yeah. You know, we bought food, we bought that, we could survive for a certain amount of time, and the ship is going to be our shelter. Some people lived aboard the ship until they built houses. Other people tore the ship apart and built houses yeah. out of it. So, it's, and that's the idea when you start thinking about exploration if you're going to explore and come back and tell people you don't bring that much stuff but if you're going to colonize or set up you know a new place to live 
you're bringing everything you need with you because you're not going back. Exactly, yeah. And in a lot of cases, you can't go back. You know, it's just too far. So you, you either make it or you don't. Well, I definitely like the sound of that. Um, I've actually started reading that. <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying it so far, but I kind of wanted to see what you were going to say here today. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so, sneaky. <laughs> I know. I know I am sneaky. <laughs> so, but um, I'm very excited about it because um, I love sci-fi. I think it, it it's not my strongest genre in terms of writing, but I love reading it. I love watching it. Um, my father introduced it to me as a very young age, and it's always just been one of my go-tos, I think, especially when I'm thinking about the way the world is and how it could be. A lot of people discount science fiction, but science fiction serves that purpose of helping you process and think about what the way the world is now and how it could be, so very excited yeah. about that. Science fiction is really sociology. It is. With, with a technical background, you know. <laughs> It's really, you know, because in most science fiction, there's this scientific idea or process or thing, but it's how does people or how does it affect the people, mm -hmm. which is what the real story is about, you yeah. know? And, and so it's always, the best science fictions are always um, people driven. Mm -hmm. And it's always, to me, it's something that is conceivable. But you have some science fiction out there, which is just, you know, not to knock it or anything, but you know that this is probably not gonna impossible. Happen. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, the time travel idea, you know, we're going to go back in time and change time. All right. That's, that's a good idea concept, yeah, but... but it's an impossible concept because if you ever change time, it change, changes your future. Exactly. And therefore you're not going to be there to, change time exactly oh you know, grandfather <laughs> uh paradox which funny enough is i was watching this science thing on youtube mm -hmm. and they would talk about a morbius you know what a morbius uh diagram is mm -hmm. where you take if you take a ribbon and you twist the last part invert it you mm -hmm. can always go around both inside and outside without changing right right so they explain the grandfather paradox that way as it being a morbius cycle okay so you start off in the present you go back you kill your grandfather your mother's never born blah 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 you come back to the present you don't exist but if you keep going forward you do exist because your grandfather was therefore born you didn't kill him your mother was born therefore you're born you come back to the point in time so it's like every other loop around yeah. you kill your grandfather you don't kill your grandfather yeah so you so you're stuck in this com continuous time loop yeah. Of, of time travel. So when you get into the, to the whole idea of time travel, going backwards in time, now going forwards in time is completely different because, because you don't know what the future holds. Exactly. So you can do anything you want if you go forward <laughs> in time. But uh, going backwards in time, you're always stuck in that loop of yeah. anything you do in the past is going to erase itself at some point. In yeah. the future. When it comes back to your present, it will be erased because Otherwise, you couldn't have done it to begin with. I think it's so funny that we somehow ended up talking about time travel. When I, I literally last night just had a conversation with somebody about the improbability of time travel in a very like specific context. It was some show they were watching. And I'm like, no, that's stupid. That wouldn't work. <laughs> All right. As you can so, see, I spent a lot of time in sci-fi world. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and again, I could go on and on about it all day. I, I love it. It's, it's just one of my favorite things. Um, I do want to move on to the next part of the interview. This is um, this whole interview has been really fun, but this is really what I call like the fun sex, silly section because um, I get to ask you questions about you that are just completely off the wall. <laughs> oh, okay. So this is Don't Judge a Book Spot's cover. The idea here is that people might have preconceived ideas of how you might respond to some things and we're going to find out, okay? Oh, okay. All right. So I can tell you right now, I don't respond to anything any way <laughs> imaginable. <laughs> so my first question, um, are you, I know it sounds silly me asking this, but I always ask you because I never like, take anything for granted. Are you familiar with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Of course I am. Okay, I just <laughs> want to make sure. Okay, 
So, because this, this whole, this question is contingent on whether or not you know who that is. <laughs> okay. But yes, I love the turtles. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, which of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would you be best friends with and why? Michelangelo, Donatello, Raphael, or who am I missing? Leo. Leo. Okay. Uh, if I remember correctly, Rafi was kind of the one who was the um, hothead. hothead. Yeah. Leo was the real intelligent one. Mm -hmm. No, no. Uh, Leo's the leader. Leo, yeah, well, he's the leader. He's the real intelligent one. Michelangelo is the scientific one. No, Michelangelo is the goofy one. Ah, okay. So Michelangelo will be the one that I would be the best <laughs> friends with because he was fun. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's he was always here. fun. Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, I, I always, for some reason, I don't know why, but I guess because a part of me knows I'm a bit of a hothead myself, I would be hanging out with Raphael. <laughs> I would be like, he would be like fighting and I'd be like, that's right. That's right. Like that would be me <laughs> being friends with Raphael. Yeah, see, I'd be hanging out, skateboarding and stuff. I don't skateboard because, you know, I'm too old. I'll break all my bones. I haven't broken a bone yet. I'm not about to try. Exactly. But when I was a kid, we used to skateboard and, mm -hmm. and go-kart ride and all that kind of stuff. And Raphael, I mean, not Raphael, Michael Angelo always seemed to be like the kid of the brunch. Yeah. 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 He still yeah. liked to have fun. Yeah, he did. Yeah. All right. The next question, and again, these are totally random. <laughs> Is there a movie or TV franchise that if you could, would you, that, that you could like appear in, like have a cameo in? Oh, there's a couple of those. Okay. I would love to be in Star Trek. And I know, right? <laughs> when, when, yeah. Number two, I'd be a Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care how uh, screwed up some of the stories are because, you know, they messed up the storyline and, and that story some horrendously in some parts. Yeah. But I don't care. I'm yeah. watching uh, Obi-Wan now. Yeah, me too. Well, yeah, I'm watching Obi-Wan now, and I think that's really cool. That's, yeah. that's coming out really good. I watched Boba Fett when that one was out. Mm -hmm. So I watched, all right, I watched them all, okay? <laughs> I have I watched, watched them, them all, all too. <laughs> and I watched them in order and out of order, and I have done the, the whole Star Wars marathon thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yes, I had to spend a weekend to say, well, you know what? It's a good day for a Star Wars marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. I, I I definitely think I would do the whole Star Trek thing. Um, it just even, you know, I and here's the thing, and I, I don't like to do the whole Star Wars versus Star Trek thing. I don't I don't care. I love them both. So if you have a preference, that's fine. But for me, Star Trek was the one that made me feel like there was a place for diversity in the future. Because yeah. from the get-go, you saw so many people of different colors and different, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds and stuff. Like, I just knew that if, if the, if anything from science fiction was going to be true, it had to be Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. And for me, Star Trek was the first one that showed you black people making into the future. Exactly. That's what <laughs> I mean. People. Yeah. That from that. The start. Black people, Asian people, like it was yeah. just, it was amazing. And I was like, don't get me wrong. I love Star Wars, but Star Trek did it first. <laughs> yeah. But Star Trek did it first. Yes. Yeah. And it showed you that humanity can get along. Mm -hmm. you know, we can actually live together mm -hmm. as a as a people. Yeah. You know, and and like I said, it was somewhere in between that 60s and 70s thing where things started turning into a much more dystopian type of future view. Yeah. And Star Trek had a very holistic uplifting view of the future like okay not everything's going to be perfect we're not going to be able to solve all problems but we can work together to solve them yeah and this and the same problems are universal yeah right? because you go someplace else to someone else's planet they're, so, they're having the same problems that we have here yeah so these problems are not uniquely human right based. they are universal problems yeah. of sociology of political you know political things you know yeah. and and that's what i liked about star trek mm -hmm. it not only did it show us that hey we're going to have people it's not just going to be just one race in the future you know everybody's going to make it together yeah and uh 
And it also showed you that, hey, these problems are solvable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, we have come to the end. I've had so much fun talking with you today, James. Oh, I love talking to you. You know, we we, we sit there, we chat back and forth. We, yeah. On the thing, so yeah, I love talking to you. I'm so glad. And I'm glad that I could share, you know, you with my um, little audience here. So why don't you go ahead and tell everyone where they can find you or your work online? Well, the best place to look for me is at Rock Hill Publishing, which is my publishing company. And it's the easiest thing to find. So you go to www.rockhillpublishing.com and you can find me. And not only do you get to find me, but you can find the other people that I publish. And if you like what I'm saying and what I do, then you will like my other writer because, you know, somewhat is based on what I have to like. When you go to a publishing company, yeah. <laughs> it's all subjective on the people who work for that company. So, I, I mean, I have a wide, wide range of interests, as you can see. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, I have romance writing. My editor is a romance writer. She's switching over now to do uh, fantasy because no one ever had just one type of story. Every yeah. writer would like to write something else. Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have historical writers, we have sci-fi, we have hard sci-fi, we have fantasy writers, you know. So go to www.rockhillpublishing.com. You'll find me and you'll find a host of other very interesting writers. All right, wonderful. Okay, so be sure to stick around because James is going to be sharing a book trailer with us. Um, to my Patreon supporters, stick around because James has some exclusive content just for you. So until next time, stay safe, be blessed, and have fun reading. Killer with Black Blood, the latest release in the Killer series. Nikki Nail Roxy sacrifices everything to reach the pinnacle of power in the world of organized crime. He will kill to become godfather of his New York Mafia family. He will die to hold on to power. His partner in crime, bulletproof Morris Mojo Johnson, does not let a little thing like death keep his friend down. Together, they seek revenge on enemies and friends as the mobsters solidify their rule. Get your copy of Killer with Black Blood from your favorite bookstore, Amazon, or direct from the publisher, rockhillpublishing.com. And also pick up a copy of Killer with a Heart and Killer with Three Heads, books one and two in the Killer series. <laughs>